So that's all the tubes above the cargo door. The reinforcement up here. All cross braces are in. This is what I came up with for mounting this on uh, what's going to be the rotisserie. I just got some 5 16 all thread because I haven't drilled these bushings out yet. I'll do that after all the welding is done. And then I'm going to use a spacer because I want to keep the frame away from the fuselage so that I have room to uh, get in there to weld stuff. five bushings because what the hell why not so I put a tie down on the back there so it's just going to sit hopefully fairly See if we can get it up in the air here. Very close. There we are, we're flying. So I'll leave it like that and get this table out from under here.
So that'll get me started. So I'm going to go ahead and drop it down into this top slot. I put multiple slots in the ends here so that I can, uh, you know, raise and lower if it's not the convenient height. <clears throat> All right, it's down in there. And uh, from a frame standpoint, uh, I just made these kind of long so that I could slide it back or forth and have plenty of room to work with. And I had enough length in the shop, so I didn't want to have to try to cut them the exact length. Obviously, they could have been shorter. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm the tail, I've got maybe six, eight inches. So I'm going to loosen those clamps, pull this guy out a little more. It'll be enough room to work, but you won't be able to actually pull it off the ends. And, uh, and then the only other thing I'm going to do on that uh, board that goes from one end to the other end is probably put a caster in the middle because uh, it wants to bounce around and it's, you know, it's a long span up for a two by six on its side. Um, so I'll probably put a caster right in the middle so it'll just kind of support it. And then I'll be ready to start playing around. So there it is in the rotisserie. Um, looks like it's going to work fine. Moves around, stable. I'll put that wheel underneath there. Uh, the tail post looks like it's going to hit, but that only limits me. It was maybe five degrees I can't get coverage, which I'm sure will be fine. Other than that, it's ready to start finish welding it. So with the fuselage in the uh, rotisserie here, I've started to weld from the clusters in the back. But I'll go over a little bit about this rotisserie. I'm not going to cover much welding because it's just a bunch of welding and there's a whole lot of people on YouTube that are far better welders than I'll ever be. You can watch one of those heroes. But basically these ends here, I just doubled up some three quarter inch plywood and I, uh, let's get it in the shot. And then I cut some notches for where this tube can go in. So to change levels, all you gotta do is pick it up and slide it in. And I'm very happy I did that because right away I was moving it up and down on the tail to get a better seating position. So that's worked good. The rest just is some wood, some two by sixes down the bottom. I did have to put a caster in the center of that, which supports that well. My high-tech system for rotating it is I just put a tie down to a hook down there, rotate it to where I want it, and hook the tie down on. So far, it's working great. Other than that, nothing to it. So I'm making some progress on welding these clusters and if there's one thing I've learned is I don't weld anything if I can't get both my hands with the filler and the torch on something solid that's comfortable to support them. And what I've come up with is just a couple pieces of pine here. Let me kill this weld. So I've just got a quick clamp. And it needs to be a quick clamp because you only have one hand to work with. And a couple pieces of pine. And by putting one crossways in the fuselage there, I can move this guy around to wherever I want, clamp him, move it to this face, and move him over, and always have a hand rest. 
and the quality of my welds has gone up probably tenfold by doing that. All right, so, and I've welded the inside of this cluster and I need to weld out here. So like I said, to put these boards on, what I'm gonna do here is set this guy like this. And that will give me somewhere to put my hand down here. There we go. So that'll work well, filler and torch. And I'll just come from that weld over. Well, I'll bring this one down first and come over like that. And um, having that support versus trying to put my hand on the tube or use my finger, just comes out so much better. So I finished welding all the clusters on the main body of the fuselage here. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not that great of a welder, but I suck a lot less than I did when I started. And so I thought I'd go over a few of the things I learned that made my life better. <clears throat> because at the beginning, I was a lot more frustrated by the end. Things were just normal, come in, do the job. Everything went, went okay. So first one is argon. It takes um, everywhere, every bit of 20 CFM to uh, have enough argon to uh, cover the weld area, especially when you're working up in the V's and the, the crevices and the tubes. So I originally started out with my argon too low, which just causes all kinds of problems, sparks and <clears throat> things you don't want. Post flow on argon, I had too low to start with too. And if you ever watch those heroes on YouTube who can weld and then everything looks beautiful when they're done, their tip looks beautiful, and your tip looks kind of rough, oxidized, well, one of the things they'll do that is that the post flow is too short. So what happens, you stop your weld and argon shuts off and the tip's still hot. So then it oxidizes. Same thing with keep, keeping that torch over the top of the weld till the post flow shuts off. That helps with the weld not looking so oxidized. And then also, if you're moving the torch around, it's very hard to keep argon on it. So if you just hold it all there, you had a nice um, plume of argon that it was all sitting on, let it sit in there until it cools down. You'll notice your tips start to look better, and so do your welds. The other thing was amperage. So you'll see things that'll say rule of thumb. You want to run amperage about one amp per tenth of uh, or a thousandth of thickness of material. But I found that doesn't work so well because when you come around and you're continuing a weld over a tack or onto another weld that you've already put down, you need a little more amperage to consume that tack or consume that other weld. So I generally run five to six amps above the tubing size and then you gotta use the pedal to keep out of it so you don't blow holes in the tube. Uh, but that gives you enough amperage that when you get into like I said, a big tack or something that you have enough to fully consume it. With 35 thousandths in the back of the fuselage, I was running about 38 amps. All the way up at the front, when you get into like the engine bushings and uh, the really heavy tubes there, I was running 90. But you have to use a lot of pedal to keep from destroying the tubes next to that. 
and keep your heat off the smaller tubes. Filler rod, I use 45 thousandths and 62 thousandths, which is 16th. Um, that worked really well. So on the smaller wells in the back and 35 thousandths tubes, the 45 thousandths works just fine. Same thing with the 49. You get up in the front when you're the wings and the landing gear and the engine bushings, the uh, 16th will make your life a lot better. Also, if you have a, un, a poor fit up somewhere, yeah, I know, you don't have any of that, but I had a couple. Uh, it's much easier to fill the gap with the, uh, with the larger filler rod. So total, um, total argon I consumed was about 300 cubic feet. I have a 120 cubic foot bottle. I filled it twice, plus it was partly full when I started. About 900 pounds in it, so somewhere 300, 300 plus cubic feet. Obviously a better welder would do it all quicker and use a lot less, but that's what it took me. Uh, and same thing with filler, filler rod. I use like maybe three pounds total. And that was a question I had when I started, how much filler rod do I need to buy? Well, I got plenty left over, and, um, and I would say that a good welder would have used a lot less filler, filler rod than I did too. But when you're, when you're not the greatest welder, you tend to go slow. You tend to have to put more filler in, and all that kind of cascades downward. One other thing on the helmet. So especially when you start in the back and you're doing 35 thousandths tube and they're pretty small, you're not putting a lot of heat in there. Um, you have to kick the sensitivity up on your helmet 100% or whatever the highest setting is, so it's very sensitive. But the other setting that I didn't fully think about was the delay. And the delay is how long it doesn't see a spark before it'll turn back to clear. And if you don't kick that up, then you can just you know, back off on the pedal because you're getting a little too hot and have your helmet flash back to, to, to light and not dark. And that just ruins the next five minutes while you've got dots on your eyes. So I generally ran about five seconds on the, uh, on the helmet to come back to uh, bright out. And uh, like I said, as high as you can go on sensitivity, especially when you're doing those really small um, low amperage welds. And then the shade, I actually dropped it down as low as eight on them. You're only welding at 35 amps. The intensity on that arc isn't very much and it's hard to, hard to see. Never had a problem with any dots or anything at eight. Up at the front when you start doing wings and stuff, we're up to 65 thousandths tube and you're kicking the amperage up, I take it back up to nine. So that's mostly what I kind of learned out of it. Um, I'm just like every other person who's done this and I wish the welds I did at the beginning I could go back and redo because the, the improvement from one end to the other is very obvious.